So here's the argument that you will sometimes hear. It is that Medicare for all is slavery. Nationalized healthcare is slavery. And you'll hear these from different people like Ben Shapiro or I believe Ben Carson said it. You'll also hear this argument from me. I think Medicare for all is slavery because what it essentially does is puts an obligation on the people they never agreed to. Actually, now that I think about it, I think regular Medicare does the same thing. So you really could make the argument that Medicare period is slavery. But I'm here to tell you why it is clearly and obviously not slavery. So before we get into detail on this argument, we first have to understand what slavery is. Slavery is essentially ownership of another person. More specifically, it's the idea that you're entitled to the time and labor of somebody else. So if you're somebody's slave, well that person can demand things of you and you have no recourse to say no because they're entitled that from you. If somebody else is entitled to your body, your time, your labor, anything about you against your will, you are a slave. And I think that Rand Paul tried using this argument with Obamacare. So given the definition of slavery I just put forward, let's carefully analyze the argument whether or not Obamacare is slavery. One of the things that Obamacare does is require you to purchase insurance whether you want it or not. It's a mandate that you use some of the fruits of your own hard work and labor to purchase something you may or may not actually want, and you have no recourse in the situation. Someone else is deciding how to utilize the fruits of your time and labor against your will, meaning that they essentially claim a greater right to it than you have, which means that they own your time and labor, ergo, yes, Obamacare is slavery. And Bernie Sanders had a physician there, and the physician basically debunked what, you know, what uh, Rand Paul said. So this is the appeal to authority fallacy. Well, this person is a practitioner of medicine, so not only must they be an expert on how to provide health care, but also the best way to finance it as well. Just because you have knowledge and skills regarding how to provide a particular service doesn't necessarily mean you have the knowledge and skills needed to actually make economic decisions regarding that service. But anyway, so Medicare for all is clearly not slavery. So keeping in mind the definition of slavery I just presented, in order to deny the claim that Medicare for All is slavery, the progressive voice has to demonstrate that Medicare for All does not in any way title somebody to the time, labor, or body of another person. First of all, the Medicare for All plan that Bernie Sanders had was basically just a universal Medicare card. So everybody gets, everybody in the country receives a universe, a Medicare card that everybody has. Yeah, everybody just gets this magic free card that they can just use anytime they need medical services. You gotta love how socialists always seem to portray their shit as so simple and straightforward. Yeah, it's a magic free money card the government just hands out as if they're like giving out gift cards to Macy's or something. You can then purchase supplemental um, insurance through the private, you know, through the private industry if you wanted to. What he's not mentioning is that these private insurance plans would not be allowed to compete with the government at all. Not just disadvantaged when competing with the government, like, you know, how you still have to pay for public school even if you send your kids to private school. No, you're straight up barred from competing with the government. If you actually look at the Medicare for All bill being proposed by Bernie Sanders, one of the things that it does, and it's very clear about this too, is that it bans duplicative insurance. What that basically means is that anything covered by the government plan is not allowed to be covered in any private insurance policy. The supposed reason for this is to prevent private insurance companies from scamming people, but the actual effect that this has is it basically gives the government carte blanche to gut your insurance policy. Well, think about it. At any time, the government can just decide to cover something that's in your private policy, and then bam, you lose that from your policy. And what are you going to do about it? There's nothing you can do. You're not allowed to compete with them. As a matter of fact, there's essentially nothing stopping the government from just covering everything and barring out private insurance entirely. You'll often notice that people who advocate for Medicare for All never seem to discuss this aspect of it, or at least discuss it in depth, and I have a feeling it's for a reason. But everybody gets this insurance card and then that's then used at the hospitals. So there's clearly nothing about that that would make it slavery in any way. Well yes, but that's because you're framing the issue in a way that excludes the slavery. Of course I could just say, here you go, it's a free healthcare money card. Just use it whenever you need healthcare. There, see, there's no slavery going on here. But where does the money in that card come from though? And what if I don't want to use the government card? What if there's, say, another insurance program and I'd rather use their card? See, this is a common strategy used by socialists. They focus specifically on the benefits of what they propose and ignore or at least significantly downplay the drawbacks of it. But when we start to talk about single-payer healthcare systems, 
believe it or not, sing all single payer means is it's funded by the government through taxes. And there you go. There's the slavery. It's funded in a way that's coercive, that there's no way to opt out of. It requires taking advantage of time and labor that other people perform against their will. Ergo, it's slavery. And because it's single payer, it's all paid by the government. Well, yeah, sure, it's paid for by the government, and that wouldn't necessarily be a problem, but currently the way it works is that the government obtains all its funding coercively. We don't currently have voluntary taxation. If we did, then yeah, great, a government run health care program to take care of people who can't afford their medication, great, wonderful. But until we do start moving towards more voluntary forms of taxation, any sort of funding for your precious government program is going to come from the backs and the labor of those who are unwilling. There are different types of single-payer healthcare systems. And they all suffer from the same fundamental problems. A lack of market signals to determine optimal resource allocation, a lack of incentive to economize, a lack of competition to pressure improved quality and lower prices. These are all going to be problems inherent to any healthcare system that's funded coercively and doesn't allow for competition, whatever spin you happen to put on it. And this is where it starts to get a bit confusing. So, for example, in Britain, they have the NHS, the National Health Service. So, basically, with they do is they actually have a nationalized health care where the government pays for it and it's run by the government and they actually have a really good health care system yeah why don't you go tell that to alfa evans family i'm sure they love to hear you go on about how wonderful the nhs is and with wait times that are even less than the united states you know there's a lady in wales who fell down the stairs in a building broke both of her legs and called an ambulance it took the ambulance nine hours to get there. So before this lady even got to the hospital, before any medical professionals even responded to her at all, she had to wait nine hours. If that's how long you have to wait for the fucking ambulance, imagine how long you have to wait for the actual medical care. Canada, on the other hand, they actually have a system where most of the, uh, all of the funding of course comes from the government, but most of the Canadian healthcare services are delivered from the private sector. So here's a quote that says, The Canadian system is for the most part publicly funded, yet most of the services are provided by private enterprises. While this is arguably better than having government just run the entire healthcare system outright, it still suffers from a lot of the same problems that come with socializing healthcare. In particular, a phenomenon known as third-party purchasing. Here's what I mean by that. If you're receiving something, you're concerned with the quality of it, with how good it is. If you're paying for something, you're concerned with the cost, how expensive it is. Now, a first-party purchaser is going to be concerned with both, since they're both paying for and receiving, they'll try and probably balance out between quality and cost. A second party purchaser is only concerned with quality but not cost or vice versa because they're only either paying or receiving, not both. Now if you're neither paying or receiving, you're not concerned with either the cost or the quality. And this is the problem with government purchasing. Most by definition, any government purchase would have to be a third party purchase since it's spending other people's money in the form of taxation and it's not the one using the services it's providing. So basically what this means is that there's there's basically going to be no incentive for the government to actually shop around and see which healthcare provider is providing the highest quality at the lowest cost. You know, one of the key benefits of privatization is the incentive to economize. So if you're not going to have that, why even bother privatizing at all? Most doctors do not receive an annual salary, but receive a fee per visit or service. So you're incentivizing doctors to basically half-ass treat people so that they'll get sick again and have to come back? Brilliant! According to Dr. Albert Schumacher, former president of the Canadian Medical Association, an estimated 75% of health Canadian healthcare services are delivered privately but funded publicly. So they're funded publicly but they're delivered through the private sector. So if these private sector entities are the ones primarily providing the service, then what's the point of going through the government? Why not just have the customers pay the private sector entities providing the service? As a matter of fact, this doesn't just happen with healthcare but with basically a lot of different things. For example, people often use the roads argument without government who will build the roads. Uh, private companies already build the roads. The government just contracts with them. Well, what's the point of that? Doesn't that just add an unnecessary middleman? Wouldn't it be much more effective from an economic perspective just to cut out the middleman and pay for these services directly? This is not by any means slavery because it is just like any other job. Anything else that is provided as a right through the government, even though this wouldn't be providing it as a right. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So rights are things that you're born with and have inherently. If it has to be given to you through the government or whatever, then it's not a right, it's a privilege. Because suppose that the government did start providing health care to people as a quote-unquote right, and then later decide to change their mind. Oh yeah, it was a right at one point, but now it is no longer. Yeah, that's kind of not how rights work, buddy. 
you know, similar to how the Sixth Amendment grants a right to counsel, and that means that you have a right to a lawyer in a criminal case. Well, public defense offices are usually horribly backlogged with cases, understaffed, horribly underfunded, and are usually more or less dumping grounds for lawyers who are inexperienced or unskilled. If you really want to make quality legal services more affordable and available, what you really need to do is end the monopoly that state bar associations have over the practice of law. I actually discuss this topic more in depth in another video doesn't mean that the lawyers are then slaves. So this is an example of the is therefore ought fallacy. He's looking at something that the government currently supposedly provides as a right, i.e. legal counsel, and from this draws the conclusion that the government has the ability to grant things as a right. Rather than criticizing whether or not that really is a right the government can provide, he interprets the evidence in favor of his conclusion, which, oh yeah, the government provides free lawyers, so why not provide free doctors too? Duh. Is just like any other job, if you want to be uh, a physician or whatever person and you want to work in, in healthcare industry, you can decide to work there. And if you do, it's just working like any other job. You can quit if you want to. You don't have to work anymore. No one's going to force you to work. Again, it's just like any other job. And I You're kind of missing the point there, dude. We're not actually arguing that Medicare for All would entail forcing people to practice medicine against their will. The argument is more along the lines of that claiming that a certain service is entitled to people as a right implies that someone should have an obligation placed onto them against their will, whether they agree to it or not. Even if the person ultimately providing this service is doing so of their own volition, there's still the obligation to pay for and support this service, which has to come from somewhere. Sure, maybe under Medicare for All, doctors are free to come and leave the system as they please, but how about the people paying for them? Can I, as a taxpayer, decide I don't like this system and opt into something else? So the conclusion to draw here is that even if the actual doctors aren't being enslaved, the taxpayers who have to pay for them and provide them are. I think that this argument is utterly laughable and just honestly massively stupid. You know what's really laughable and stupid? This guy never addresses the argument. The entire point of this video was to disprove the idea that Medicare for All is slavery, and not once did he actually go into the argument. Yeah, he discusses Medicare for All, he explains what it is and why he likes it, but he never explains why it's not slavery, which is kind of the whole point of this video, so you just kind of wasted your time there, dude. Anyways, as always, this has been Philosopossum, making stupidity play dead. Have a good one.